this book in Jesus' name, amen. All right, in your Bibles, Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter two, or if you, don't, if you just have a phone, you can Google Revelation 2 NIV, and then you can follow me uh, so you know that I'm not uh, lying or something. Okay. One of the main questions people ask when thinking about their own faith is where is God when things are hard? The number one question that I think I've encountered and people who are just you know, asking questions about the Christian faith or on the outside of the Christian faith, the number one stumbling block for them is the question, why does God allow suffering? And usually behind that question is not some sort of theoretical, well, over in Africa, they're struggling with this, but this in my life in particular, why did God allow it? So we're continuing our way through the book of Revelation and we are in what people call the safe part of the book. Safe because people can generally read chapters two and three and sort of understand what's going on and they're not confused unless the pastor is confusing, which let's be honest, happens sometimes. So just here's the background. Remember this book is written during the reign of Emperor Domitian. Domitian is uh, the first emperor in Roman history to invite people to call him God while he is alive. Six out of the seven cities in Revelation two and three actually have temple worship to emperors. And so the Christians refuse to participate. And because they refuse to participate, local persecution comes down on him. There is a misconception that there was some empire-wide persecution, just not true. It was always localized, didn't come from the top down, at least during this time. And all these cities at the same time, they didn't even, they also, they not only had emperor worship, they had guilds. And guilds were the place in which the market happened. And part of being part of a guild was offering sacrifice to the emperor. So you're a Christian, you now have to decide, will I participate in the idol worship of the first century? Each of these letters have a specific form to an angel and then a description of Christ, the vision of Christ that always matches the need of the church. And so it's almost like a little sidebar here. You can present Christ in different ways to different people based on what they need. It's okay. Jesus does it himself in Revelation chapter two and three. Then it's what the church has done right if, or what they've done wrong, uh, a solution a challenge, and then a warning or a promise at the end. So there are two churches that are not rebuked at all. They're the smallest churches, just go, shows you that God does not care so much about the size of a church as much as its faithfulness. And so last week was the letter to the Ephesians, the great missionary church, the church that had a godly heritage of teaching dating back to the first years of the church. The well-known people of the book of Acts came to Ephesus and started that church. They had Paul, they had Timothy, they had the apostle John. They kind of had some good pastors. And now we come to Smyrna, 35 miles north and one of the two churches that are not rebuked at all. It was a beautiful city. It was a wealthy city. They called themselves the first of Asia. There was a pride in where they lived. Maybe you may understand this kind of attitude where people speak about their place of living as the best place to live or the last best place to live. It takes so much gumption to tell everyone how great your place is compared to them. But that is what only Smyrna did in history. No one else would possibly think to act like that. We don't know why the gospel came to the city or how, not, we know why, we don't know how it came to the city. Uh, but in Revelation, we know that the Christians here are under duress. This was the center of emperor worship. This is the first city in the ancient world that had built a temple to the goddess of Rome. And they beat out 10 other Asian cities in 23 BC to build a temple for Emperor Tiberius. They loved themselves. They loved Rome. 
the Jews had refused to swap gods. They had refused to worship these other gods. And so the Romans had given them in particular kind of a dispensation. They don't have to do it like everyone else does. And the Christians at the beginning were seen as a subset of the Jews. But the Jews in Smyrna had ratted out the Christians. And now that the Christians weren't seen as a Jewish sect, they were facing persecution. Now, the Bible is very realistic about suffering. It's not going to lie to you. Maybe you've heard a line from one of the greatest films of all time. Life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling you something. If you don't know that that's Princess Bride, I'm going to, you need help. The Bible isn't selling anything, but there is a belief commonly held amongst Christians quietly, covertly, sometimes overtly, that if my relation, you ever thought this? If my relationship with God is good as defined by me and defined by yourself, then everything is going to work out and bad and horrible things won't happen to me. Have you ever started your day and you haven't read the Bible in a while and you read the Bible and you close and you go, well, today's gonna be good, I read the Bible. I'm the only one? What happens when hard things come? Your expectations get crushed. Your faith gets broken and shattered. And it's because, honestly, people believe something that is untrue. And they begin to experience hard things like all of us have at some point. And all of a sudden, their mind goes, well, how does the love of God and everything I hear in church about the love of God jive with the fact that I've done everything right and nothing is going right, especially when it feels so random. Expectations are a large part in how we deal with pain. And if you hold to the expectation that if you follow Jesus, things will just be so smooth and the grades will come and the wins will come and your sports team will win. I've been a Vikings fan a long time. It's not true. Okay, the jobs will work out right. The marriage will be good. The kids will be great. And, and everything you try will succeed. And, you know, you're in for a surprise. Your expectations are going to be crushed. I remember coaching a basketball team a long time ago, and we were bad, and all the sports were bad. And 10 years before, all the sports were amazing, and all the kids were like, maybe we're not good enough Christians. Maybe we're, God is punishing us. And I was just thinking in my head, no, you're terrible. You're not athletic. You're not going to win. But do you see what happened? They have tied their success and their failure to, am I following God or not? And while that, you may laugh at that, you probably do that too. So, expectations matter. Seeing the world as it truly is matters. And so we come to Smyrna now. And if you can just walk away this morning believing that God is sovereign over suffering, I'll have done my job. Okay, here we go. Verse 9 and 10. Suffering is significant and is under God's control. There are four types of suffering in this passage. Poverty, verse 9, despite living in an affluent city. You can see it on the screen. Slander at the hands of the Jews. Verse 10, prison and martyrdom because they would not bend the D to the martyrdom. So if we can, or to the emperor. So let's piece this all together. Christians had enjoyed some kind of freedom from the Roman Empire because they were seen as a Jewish sect. The Jews are outing them and now they are facing persecution because of the Jews. Now, this is sort of normal. It's not new. In the book of Acts, this happens multiple times where the Jews come together with the Roman authorities to attack the Christians. And if you read just the book of Acts, you've got harassment, physical and verbal abuse. You've got being brought to court. You've got beatings and you've got being forced to move. And then you have execution. I mean, in Acts chapter five, the 12 apostles are arrested in the temple. They're flogged and they're beaten. And then they go back and preach again. Acts 
6, Stephen is arrested and killed. Acts 7, Saul, target, Jewish Saul, targets families, kills families, puts them in prison, and people begin to scatter. In Acts 12, James is killed by the sword. Peter is arrested and escape, and the list goes on. And so when Jesus says things like, you will be hated because of me, they're like, oh yeah, I, we will be hated because of you. But the one who stands firm in the end will be saved. When you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. The church is not above Jesus. Jesus warns us in John, you will have troubles. So there is this wicked teaching in your heart, in my heart, in churches that say, as long as we stick to, to Jesus, we will never feel the beam of a cross on our back. That's not true. So let's look at each trial. Trial one, poverty, verse nine. Consider for a moment that this is a very wealthy city. This is, this is a city that had a city called the Street of Gold. This is a city that had uh, uh, the road up a mountain and on the mountain there were buildings around the top of it and they called that the crown of the city. They had some money. And so Christians are on the outs. They can't take part of things economically. They can't take part in the guilds. And so they can't get jobs. So if you wanted to be part of the power brokers, the intelligentsia, the politicians, if you wanted to participate in any part of the culture, not just the high stuff, but just the day-to-day -day grind stuff, you had to offer sacrifice to Emperor Domitian. And everyone did it. Sometimes people paid so that others would do it. It was a big deal. And so here come the Christians and their unpatriotic religion which is not allowed to worship in the way everyone else is worshiping and they can't participate in the economy. They've lost business connections. They've been fired from jobs. I mean, think of it, like you have a boss and your boss says, we need some luck. We've angered the gods, go and sacrifice to so-and-so. And you say, no, you say, okay, you're fired. Later in Revelation, the second beast marks out the world so that they can participate in the economy. Here it is from Revelation 13. There's lots of confusing things in Revelation 13. Leave all the confusing stuff behind. You can see the main point. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. You see, persecution... For Smyrna and in Revelation was a persecution of exclusion. You can't participate. And this happens today in places. You know, if, if, if you live in Greece and you become an evangelical Christian, people will now view you as not being Greek. And so you are left out. Same is true in the Balkans. You are left out of financial privileges. Same is true in India. I mean, a hundred years ago, just think of this, a hundred years ago in the United States, when you filled out that two-page mortgage application, like everyone else, you had to list your pastor. You, you had to have a pastoral reference for your mortgage, that it was culturally important for you to have some sort of religious connection. That is literally the opposite of what's happening in Smyrna. And of course, we don't do that today, but just th think of the difference of in the United States. You become a Christian, and becoming a Christian means you can climb a social ladder. It means that people might trust you more. It means that, oh, those people do it the right way, or hey, that person has integrity, they're not gonna lie. And so, you, you think of all these things as ways in order to get a job, actually becoming a Christian is a plus, but in the first century, becoming a Christian is a minus and not just like a minus down one step, a minus down a hundred steps to where you're not gonna get a job. I mean, just think through your Christian life and you begin to think like, why aren't things working out? I'm doing things right. I'm, I've done, I've worked hard. Why aren't these friendships working? It's all because of the expectation that things should work. 
I'm following Jesus. Poverty. The second one, slander. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. Those are some tough words. The slander is what is causing all of this problem. The, the Christians have been uh, protected under Roman law. Now they're not. Now this is a similar persecution to say Paul in Acts 18. He's dragged before uh, the Roman proconsul in Corinth, Galileo, and he's brought up on charges. He's ruining things in Corinth. He's not one of us. It's true of the death of Polycarp, which actually happened in Smyrna in 155 AD. Here's the recounting of his death. Polycarp was arrested, charged with being a Christian, a member of a politically dangerous cult whose rapid growth needed to be stopped. Amidst the angry mob, the Roman proconsul took pity on such a gentle old man and urged him to say, Caesar is Lord. If only Caesar could make this declaration and offer just a small pinch of incense to the Caesar statue, he would escape torture and death. Now here are the famous words of Polycarp. Polycarp responded, 86 years I have served Christ and he has never done me any wrong. How could I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Polycarp refused and was burned at the stake. For what? Refusing to offer sacrifice to Caesar. Slander doesn't originate with the Jews. It's from the synagogue of Satan. Now, this is not a call to be anti-Semitic. I don't understand anti-Semitism, honestly. John was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. The 12 apostles were Jewish. The entire Bible was written by people who were Jewish, except for Luke and Acts. To be a Christian is to be Jewish, a child of Abraham. The language is just similar to the Old Testament prophets who would always be calling unfaithful Israel, come back, come back, come back. He's saying that, John is saying in essence, those who are Israel are those who trust Christ. These people are being pushed by someone else, and that person is Satan. In chapter 12, verse 10, he's the accuser. He knows he's lost. That's 12, 12. He knows his time is short, and so he just tries to take down every single person. It's similar to the Battle of the Bulge, World War II, six weeks, starting December 16, 1944. Germany knows it's lost, but it decides we're going to kill as many people as possible. 100,000 Germans, 75,000 Americans, 55,000 British troops die in six weeks. All because the Germans had lost and they were going to kill as many people as possible. That's what Satan does. And so slander is coming through the lips of people and they know there are Christians and they're slandering the Christians. Have you ever been slandered for being a Christian? Our own culture teaches us through trite sayings that are meant to catechize us. They're like our culture's catechism. Christians run up against these all the time. Let's, let me try out a few of them on you. Love is love. Kindness is everything. Judge not. You have to be yourself and not care what anyone else says. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history. I am free to do what I want as long as I don't hurt anyone else. Believe science. Science is real. Love is whatever I make things. Follow your heart. I live my truth. I'm a man in a woman's body. And as Christians bump up against those idols, you have a decision to make. One writer, Leslie Newbegin, said the choice of the church in every age and always will be this. Will your identity be shaped by scripture or the culture? Will your identity be shaped by the biblical story or the cultural story? Now, just ask yourself, does the American church uh, as a whole have a story of differentiation from the culture? Or is the method with the American church of we're just like you? We're not different from you. You're just like me. And so Christian teachers have a choice. Will you keep your head down and call children by their preferred pronouns and risk being fired? 
Students, you have a choice to make whether to play along. Will you shrink back and celebrate redefinitions of marriage? And on and on we could go. I know these are super specific and they are complicated issues, but the Christians in Smyrna had to decide, will we offer sacrifice to the idols of the first century? And the Christians today have to decide, will we participate in the idol worship of today or not? That's where the slander is. All right, third one, prison. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Now, this is normal through church history that Christians are thrown into prison. One well-known one is from John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. While he was in prison, they would bring his blind daughter to see him. This is, what it was, this is what people wrote about it. It was his blind daughter, Mary, a teenager, who upset him the most. Day by day, she groped and, st- and stumbled her way to jail, where her father spent 13 years supplementing the prison fare with whatever food she could carry. Bunyan was haunted what might happen to her if, she, if he died in prison. Already the shock of his imprisonment had caused his wife to miscarry. Seeing his agitation, prison authorities informed him to, he, that all he had to do To get out of jail was the sign of paper saying he will never preach again. Immediately he knew what he had to do. He had been called to preach and he would say no to their offer. The test can be hard. This is a a hard test that some Christians have to face. I was many years ago, I guess I'm old enough to say many now. Years ago, years ago, I remember worshiping in China on my birthday and it was a room, we, we came into this uh, communist building with 10 foot thick walls. It was really probably four foot thick concrete. So very soundproof. And we showed up over a two hour period and it was a room of maybe 20, 20 somethings. And they were all worshiping together. Where are their parents? They're all in jail for handing out Bibles. In Romania, before communism fell, most pastors had been in prison. Spies would come to Bible studies pretending to be Christians and then write down the prayer requests of the people and share them with the government who would then imprison people. You imagine going to prayer meetings and not being sure? Right now, in Myanmar, one of my friends is in jail, Samson, for being labeled a terrorist. What is his terrorist activity? He is the head of the Kachin Baptist Convention. What does scripture tell us? Hebrews 13, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourself are suffering. That is, we are the body of Christ. We are called to remember these people because if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. We know this. I can barely remember my own family members I don't see. And here it's remember those who are in prison now. There is some ambiguity here in the text. Look at verse 10. I have the NIV and the ESV translation up on the screen. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Okay, ESV, verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, comma, that you may be tested. Who is doing the testing? The NIV seems to say Satan. The ESV correctly, I think, leaves it ambiguous as if to say, it's not Satan that's testing you, it's God that's testing you. You might remember the words of James, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face various kinds of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Who is doing the testing in your suffering It's not Satan, it's God. And if you've met people who have suffered, who do not, they they seem to have made it through, they're not limping in the end, and they've come out on the other side, and what are they? As people who've been in Stephen ministry, they're more beautiful, they're kinder, they're more patient, and they've been through hell. Prison. Number four, martyrdom. Be faithful even to the point of death. The killing of Christians is a normal occurrence. Revelation six, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? And the answer from the throne in Revelation six is, wait, more people have to die. 
uh, Jesus, <laughs> don't you know Christians are dying? Yes, and more must die. I, I know people who have lost family members to martyrdom. It's devastating to families. It's devastating to friends. They don't seek it. They don't celebrate it. I've been with pastors who have scars on their back from their parents beating them from, from converting. I, I was once with this Afghan guy who came to Christ and he had been beaten pretty badly. And he told me he was gonna go back and share the gospel with them. And I said, why are you going back? And he said, what, what do you think they would think of my God if I ran? Hmm. Do you remember this picture, which will be on the screen? In 2014, ISIS took Mosul, Iraq, Islamic militants began marking the homes of Christians with this symbol. It's the symbol, it's the letter N, and it was a symbol for the Nazarites. That was a pejorative term for Christians. And so any home that was marked with this symbol, either were told they had to convert, pay a tax, or die. And as the Christians were killed, one Catholic priest wrote this, they may mean it as a mark of shame, but we wear it as a mark of hope. Yes, we are, the armor, we are the army of the resurrected Nazarene, the master and Lord of the universe, the man of God Almighty, the second person of the most holy trinity. You may kill us and expel us, but we Christians will never go away. Can you imagine having that symbol put on your house for a tax to convert or to die? So there are the four ways, persecution, economic slander, economic slander, prison, death. Now, what's the deal with the 10 days? Numbers are fun in the book of Revelation and uh, people have lots of ways of interpreting them and most of them are very wrong. I, I say that with like, I can believe lots of kinds of interpretations, but most of them are wrong. Let me narrow it down for you. You will suffer for 10 days. What is that? Well, we know from the book of Revelation that book of Revelation draws a lot of material from the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, chapter one, guess how many days Daniel suffers for? You're not gonna believe it. It's 10. Daniel then said to the guard and the chief official appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with the other young men who eat royal food and treat your servants in accordance to what you see. So he agreed and they tested them for 10 days. So what is the test in Daniel? The test in Daniel is, will Daniel compromise by eating food sacrificed to idols. And Daniel's conscience is so bothered by it that he says, I will not compromise. What is the test in Smyrna? Will we sacrifice to the idols or will we face slander? It's the same thing. Now the number could mean, here are the other interpretations, a short period of time. That is Christ reigns for a thousand years in Revelation 20, 10 days is not much. It could just be a reference to the gladiatorial games in Smyrna. Guess how many days the, the gladiatorial games are in Smyrna? 10 days. The point is that God controls the length and time of suffering. That's the main point. I want you to think about that, that God looks out at time and says, for 10 days you will suffer and then it will end. Why not 11? Why not nine? Because he controls it. He is the first and the last. He is the sovereign God. And so scripture wrestles with this. You know what I'm talking about, right? What does it mean that God is the first and the last sovereign king and that the Christians are dying? Different writers in scripture say things like Job, you know, God took everything from me. Psalmist, how long, O Lord? How long? The prophets, you, Lord, destroyed the city. You, Lord, destroyed the city. Luke chapter 13, the tower of Salome falls on people. The disciples say, hey, Jesus, what's up with that? And all Jesus says is repent. Like, give us an answer, Jesus. Apostle Paul, of course, God uses suffering for our good. I mean, let's just, let me just show you some passages from Job as you try to wrestle with this issue. Job 13. Remember Job lost everything, kids, land, health. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Who is the he? 
it's God. Job 16, seven, God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. Job 16, nine, God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponents fasten on me his piercing ears. And yet at the same time in Job 16, Job runs to God. Now, and even now my witness in heaven, my advocate on high, my intercessor is my friend. It's like, Job, are you drunk? As my eyes pour out tears to God. And in case anyone thinks, if any of you think, you know what, Job just misspoke. Here is God rebuking Job's friends at the end in Job 42. I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So God agrees with Job. He says that in the face of impersonal suffering. Like, why did this natural disaster kill all my kids? At least in Smyrna, it seems purposeful. But you, you really have two options on this issue. Either you can believe that God has control over suffering and that it is meaningful and ordained, or you can believe evil is meaningless, blind, and useless. There's no, there's no in between. Back to Smyrna. Notice that this is not a letter of condolence, which is what you would think. Someone write, oh, I'm so sorry you are suffering. This is not a letter of apology. God's not saying, guys, I'm sorry. My hands are tied. Instead, he speaks power, strength, and hope. So the suffering is real. So you begin to ask yourself now in the back of your mind, okay, what if I'm not suffering? Listen, number one, the suffering is only for 10 days, which means it's not like every second of every moment. But what if like you've never ever faced anything remotely in any way, see how many times I'm saying this, pushback because of your Christian faith? What if you've received none? Then you have to ask yourself, does anyone actually know I am a Christian? Have I smoothed, have I stayed quiet to keep my friends, to keep my job so people won't think less of me so that, I mean, you could just keep going. So I'm accepted in the community so I avoid confrontation. I mean, I I read of a Christian ministry a few years ago, their board was anonymous because they didn't want the cultural ramifications to being involved with a Christian ministry. I mean, even for those of you who've walked with Christ for a while, is the entirety of your Christian witness If I have integrity, that will be my witness. That's part of it. It's a good thing. But is that all of it is? Like you're, it's the passive approach is I'm gonna wait for everyone to come to me. Listen, no one's coming to you if they don't know. Lots of people have integrity. You're doing it the right way. People will come and ask me why. Have you spoken up about the idols of today? I think sometimes we, close our mouths because we want to say things like, I just want to be careful. Have you said that? I've said this. I want to be careful. I want to be wise. I actually envision myself being compassionate and not bringing the hard words of scripture into someone's life. And when I do that, I place myself up above God and say, well, I'm more compassionate than God because God's words certainly are not as compassionate as how I will treat this person in front of me. Is that crazy? But that's what it is. You have to be careful. Revelation calls these kinds of actions and people cowards, cowards. So there's various ways Christians suffer. Second point, we'll speed up now. Suffering is not as bad as it seems. Here's verse, I'll I'll just show you three ways. There's no rebuke here. They're suffering. There's nothing going wrong. They haven't done anything wrong. He encourages them three ways. Way one, We have a sovereign God who loves us. Verse eight, he is the first and the last who died and came to life. Why is suffering not as bad as it seems? Because we are not above Jesus. He has suffered. You know, every religion has some sort of answer for the question of suffering. There is no better answer than this one. Anytime someone pushes on me, well, what's the deal with a loving God and suffering in the world? I'm like, yeah, what's the deal with it? What's your answer? Silence. We have a savior who died for us. 
and for the Christians in Smyrna, the comfort, repeat this in your head many times, the comfort to people in Smyrna is not the immediate relief of their suffering. The comfort is not the immediate relief of suffering. The comfort is Jesus suffered too. The comfort is the Lord died and he is risen. If you die, you will not be separated. What does Paul say? You will not be separated from the love of God. What, what are the things that you will not be separated from? There's no words that can separate you. There's no job or job loss that can separate you. There's no friendship you would lose that will separate you. There's no personal history that will separate you. There's no weird you know, like personality glitches in yourself that will separate you. There's no loss of social standing that will separate you. He is the first and the last. He gets the last word. So the slander, the imprisonment, the killing are all temporary. The final word are, we belong to Jesus. He doesn't forget his bride. He loves his bride. We are at the center of his affection. The connection is deep. We will sit on a throne that he sits on. He has joy. We have joy. He does not leave us behind. He does not go, oh, I forgot about them. We are his greatest concern. We are his body. We are the church. What, what has he done for us? He's given himself for us. Okay, enough. Back to verse nine. Here is a phrase that keeps coming up. He knows. This is the great promise of scripture. He knows. He knows and he's not removing the pain. He is aware. He is aware when your employer wants you to bow down to idols and you refuse to bow down. He knows the snickering of family members about what you believe. He knows the names of the Christians in prison. He knows. He knows. He knows. You can write that on your forehead. You can write that so you see it in the mirror. You can write that anywhere. He knows on your heart. And because of that, you don't have to be afraid. Verse 10, do not fear. What is there to be afraid of if God is for us? All right. There's spiritual wealth that's possible. So we follow a sovereign Lord. It's not as bad as it seems because he's sovereign. It's not as bad as it seems because we can be spiritually wealthy. You are rich, even though you are poor. What is that? Paul, Paul talks about it in Romans 8. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs of Christ. If we share in his sufferings, in order we also may share in his glory. I consider that the present suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. That's, that's wealth. That's spiritual wealth. We are children of God. I mean, the apostle Paul summarizes his entire ministry in many ways. Here's one of them, 2 Corinthians 6. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing, making many rich, this is a great ministry statement, yet having nothing, yet possessing everything. Darren, what is your ministry? What, what do you want it to be? Making many rich. What a life. It's not as bad as it seems because we're spiritually wealthy. And then last one, because it's not death to die. We get a victor's crown. It's talked about many times in the New Testament. Here's James. Blessed is the one who perseveres in trial, having stood a test. That person will receive the crown of life from the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9, everyone who competes in the games go into strict training. They get a crown that will not last. We get a crown that lasts forever. We're given crowns, victory. We will not be hurt. Verse 11, some get hurt in martyrdom. We aren't hurt by the second death. The second death is judgment and separation from God in Revelation 20. You will not be hurt. So, not everyone makes it. That's why we're told we have to be faithful. Last thing, how are you supposed to be victorious? Like, how are you supposed to make it? Revelation gives us one answer, chapter 12. They triumphed over Satan, that's him, by the blood of the lamb, and the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Your biggest problem is not Satan. Your biggest problem is God until you know him. And here are the two ways you overcome Satan. Way one, the blood of the lamb. Way two, the word of his testimony. Way three, not loving your life. That is number one, 
you don't overcome Satan on your own strength, thank God. You guys have lived, some of you have lived a Christian life long enough to, to know that there are many days when you are not able to hang on. And you are not hanging on because of you, you're hanging on because of Christ, the blood of the lamb. That's how you overcome, not the strength of your faith, but the strength of his blood. That's how you conquer. And two, the word of their testimony. That is, you overcome, which is now the opposite, you overcome by proving that you actually believe this stuff is true, by bearing witness to the truth that Caesar is not Lord and the idols of the United States are not Lord, but that Christ is Lord. Corey ten Boom, this is kind of pulls it all together, was studying the Bible in a concentration camp while she was locked up. This is what she writes. Like waves clustered in a blazing fire, we gathered around the Bible that we had holding our hearts. The blacker the night grew, the brighter and truer and beautiful burned the word of God. I would look about us as my sister read, watching the light leap face to face. More than conquerors, it was not a wish, it was a fact. We knew it. We experienced it minute by minute in that concentration camp, poor, hated, hungry. We were more than conquerors, not we shall be, we are. The thing I want you to ponder this week, what are the expectations you have and what are the things you think God has promised for you versus what are the things God has promised for you? He is not apologizing to you for testing you. He is giving you hope to sustain you to make you more beautiful in his sight. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we know that people, even Sharon who is up here and others, have suffered hard things, hard health things, hard family things. And some people are limping and falling away, and some people are limping, and because of the blood of Christ are making it through and being made beautiful. There are people here who do not yet know you, and for those uh, who don't want to bow to the idols of an American culture or any culture, may they bow to the Lord Jesus. Um, what is written in this book is true, and it happened. And so we turn our eyes to Jesus, who is listening to us, who is alive and active, and is walking amongst his church, even this one in Bozeman, Montana. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing as we close.